Well, hello and welcome to Join the Conversation, a podcast uh, of the Student Housing Matters website and sponsored by Capstone on Campus Management. And today is my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Sharon McDade, who is the Senior Executive Leadership and Search Consultant with Greenwood Associates. This conversation today is a part of our continued celebration of COCM's 20th anniversary as we look back on our partnerships with various higher education organizations. Uh, Sharon is the former American Council on Education or ACE Fellows Program Director. And during her time in this role, COCM was honored to be a sponsor of the Fellows Program, including participating in some, uh, leading some sessions on housing. And uh, just on a personal note, uh, it was a real honor and privilege to be able to get to know Sharon and call her a friend. So welcome, Sharon. Thank you very much for inviting me. So let's start by talking about the story of ACE and the Fellows Program and how you got involved in that. The um, American Council on Education is, is, I always describe it as the big umbrella association of American higher education. Um, because institutions of all sectors and, and also associations that are sector specific are all members. Um, and you can also have uh, affiliate members such as your organization. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a very large canopy representing the um, interests and uh, the power uh, of, of American higher education. Um, the Fellows Program uh, was founded by, the, by ACE in 1965. Um, their research had led them to believe that there needed to be um, a high level research, to, uh, a leadership development program to help move the pipeline of people along, particularly women and people of color, towards leadership positions. And in 1965, I can remember going to an ACE conference where there was a gathering of women presidents and the women presidents could sit around two banquet round tables while the rest of us sat around the edges. And wow. several of those uh, women presidents wore nuns' habits. So it was a very small number of women who were in presidencies at that point to give an, an idea of how things have changed. And the Fellows Program has been a big part of that. Um, um, it now boasts that it has had more than 2,500 uh, participants um, who have moved on up from the positions that they had at the time of the fellowship to deans, vice presidents, and presidents. So the, the number of fellows who are, are kind of infiltrated across all types of higher education institutions and associations is really quite powerful. Um, and in addition to that, each fellow had a mentor, a president at a university who, spot, who uh, worked with them for a year. So you multiply that by the number of mentors and there's a huge number of people who have been involved with and touched the fellows program in addition to people like you who became involved in other kinds of ways. Um, it's different in relationship to other leadership development programs, and it's a full year experience. Um, um, people are fellows for the entire year. There's a, uh, some in-person and now virtual sessions, uh, but the real guts of it is a uh, placement at another institution where for some period of time, and there's several modalities of that, a fellow can go and literally stand behind a president and see what happens at that level and get an idea of the arc of leadership for a higher education institution. So how did you become involved in it? I've been involved with the fellows program for a long, 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 long time. Um, uh, much earlier in my career, I had been director of the Institute for Educational Management at Harvard University, which was a sister program, um, also founded in the early uh, 1960s. Um, so I was always at conferences, um, hanging out with the people who were then the directors of the fellows program. Um, they periodically invited me to come and serve as, um, uh, someone who helped with their admissions process. They had an interview process that I participated in and other types of things over the years. Um, and then, um, the directorship opened and I was lucky enough to be selected to be the director in 2008. And I, I was in that position until I left in 2012. So it was a, an exciting period to be there. We expanded the size of the fellows program. Um, uh, we um, updated curriculum and brought in more, more people like you and Doug Brown 
to bring real life um, uh, experiences in running different aspects of the institution. Well, it was a real joy, and uh, and I was and as I was preparing for this podcast interview, I was trying to remember there was one particular session that I got to participate in where you led it, and I think it was about leadership. It was about leadership uh, characteristics or personalities, and I remember it was a wonderful presentation. I wish I could find my notes on it, um, but you did a great job in leading. Thank that. you. So, and, and that was the session I did all the time I was director, and then. Uh, came back and did several times afterwards as they, uh, the new directors invited me back. Um, and it focused on leadership um, actions, strategies, um, um, particularly um, focused on the Bowman and Deal frames, which was something that was used throughout the program. So thank you for remembering. So how did you get involved in, what really intrigued you about leadership? Because it sounds like most of your um, professional career has been kind of focused on that. Am I correct? It has been. That's been the leadership and leadership development has been the real through thread of my career um, from leading programs, creating programs, assessing programs of leadership, research on leadership. Um, uh, my doctorate degree was from Harvard. Um, I needed to be employed somehow or somewhere to be able to help pay for that experience. I was lucky to get a job. Um, in the office of the Institute for Educational Management at Harvard. I looked down around and realized that there was a ready-made dissertation here with all these people and what they did. Um, and so the Institute supported me to do my dissertation. And it was on leadership and leadership development, specifically related to that, to the IEM program. But that got me launched on looking at leadership from all sorts of directions. So as I noted, I eventually became director of that program, created a middle management program there. And it's um, intertwined with what I'm doing now, which is uh, facilitating strategic planning, because a key part of leadership is strategic planning. And that was something that I did in all sorts of ways uh, and taught about uh, along the way. So it all comes together and the, the threads intertwine in a way that makes sense to me, if not to anyone at my career. <laughs> well, Tell, talk a little bit about maybe some personal stories about, I know you enjoy teaching. Uh, I know you enjoy uh, talking about, uh, teaching about leadership, about strategy, but are there any uh, stories you can tell about things that you really enjoy, people maybe that you saw uh, really progress in the program and then later go on to become leaders in higher education? Um, one of my favorite uh, examples of that is that I, I did lots of um, volunteer things on program sessions, whatever, about leadership and leadership development at various academic conferences. Um, and that often meant that the participants in those sessions, they were like the pre-sessions or the post-sessions of a conference, were um, emerging leaders, people really at the beginning of their sessions. Um, and I would use assessment instruments, for example, the Bowman and Deal framework or other types of things, um, and and um, see their um, how they would score at that point. And I would explain to them that as they moved through their career, um, their scoring would change because they would learn so much more about leadership. And on numerous occasions, um, later on, I would work with these same people when they had become vice presidents and presidents. And they would all chuckle to me kind of in as an aside and say, yep, it changed. I see what happened there. I learned a whole lot. Thank you very much. You got me started on, on this learning process and, and having a way to articulate my leadership. So that was always something that gave me a, a great chuckle because um, people realize their own evolution and improvement as leaders. Well, what a great feeling it must be to know being involved in, in not only in, in leadership in a variety of different venues, but with the fellows program, especially, I mean, you, you help people progress to, to take up those positions. I mean, that must be a great, a wonderful sense of accomplishment. It is. Um, as I think about um, my own doctoral st students, the students who I chaired their doctoral dissertations who were in my classes, who I met through the sessions that I just mentioned through the fellows program, through the Institute for Educational Management through the, the people I have met through the different institutions where I facilitated strategic plan. 
I feel so privileged with the literally thousands of people that I've gotten to know. And I'm always blown away when someone reaches back to me and says, this thing that you said or did had some connection. And I get those kinds of outreaches fairly regularly. You just wow. don't realize what kind of an impact that you may have. That's wonderful. Well, you know, you know very well that COCM was honored to help with some of the opening and closing retreat. Uh, we, were, we were talking a little bit before we started recording about the years that we did that. <coughs> we did, uh, but there was a case, case study that was used, and you know it very well, Pennyfield College. And uh, talk a little bit about how that study came about and how it was used with the fellows. Um, Pennyfield College was a real um, bedrock part of the curriculum of the fellows program for literally decades. Um, it was created by Marlene Ross, who was my predecessor as director of the fellows program. She had been there for several decades. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, um, she had felt that there needed to be an immersive experience in which the fellows would learn about various aspect, aspects of leadership and running a college or university instead of just having people stand up in the front and give lectures on various things. Um, the, the case evolved over time with different people contributing or helping with the facilitation of it until it became quite a robust learning experience. And poor Pennyfield College always fell on hard times just about the <laughs> month before the fellows program began. And deep analysis needed to be done on its finances, its resources, its infrastructure, its all those types of things. Um, and lo and behold, through the brilliance of the fellows each year, Pennyfield survived and uh, rose from, from to new heights. Uh, so Pennyfield had quite a, an interesting history. Uh, Pennyfield was a, 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 a kind of a liberal arts with extra uh, a, a kinds of programs in it in some unknown, unspecified place that was not in a big city, but could have been in a suburban or uh, type of thing like that, which is, describes lots and lots of institutions. Um, it was kept small because then it would make the analysis piece of it small. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I had... Um, analyzed when I uh, stepped into the executive leadership role was the two things that were missing uh, were about the marketing of the college. Every year is the, the fellows groups uh, analyze the program. That was one of the issues that they said needed to be addressed and that there was no housing component. Um, and certainly a college of the type of Pennyfield would have had housing some way, shape or form. Through, so through um, an interesting set of circumstances, uh, we were able to bring housing into the equation. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, I was looking and uh, I'm kind of embarrassed to show this. Here is my map of the Pennyfield campus that I made. And it was kind of fun because uh, you got to play master planner and uh, come up with housing. Uh, but when you talk about the circumstances, I know you and Doug Brown were on a bus. We were coming back from a dinner one night at the CUMU, uh, the college, what is it? Urban it's Coalition of Urban and Metropolitan Universities. Thank you. Uh, and that was at Fresno State. And you all got to chatting and Doug being the very innovative and creative person that he is uh, talked about uh, helping you with that. And uh, so that that's how we got involved. Uh, just an aside note, what was really fun for me, I had had so many wonderful learning experiences working for Doug. You know, Doug came from higher education. He ran housing on a college campus. I never did that. Uh, so through the Fresh Eyes Consulting that we did, we took, we took lots of notes with every campus. And so what was fun about Pennyfield was going back through all those different consulting assignments and basically pulling some of the worst things that we saw uh, at campuses and putting them all in one, one, one campus. <laughs> Uh, not not everything that was bad, but just some of the really interesting things that we had come across. Uh, but it was a it was a it was a fun experience. I hope the fellows really got something out of that. Uh, we seem to get some good feedback on that about uh, their gratitude for having that component in it. Uh, it was fun to hear. You know, they would they would get in groups and then they would come up with. Uh, I know at one point we talked about come up with programs and policies and approaches 
uh, for how you would solve these problems. And they came up with some great, uh, they great did. recommendations. They did. Um, I think that story has, um, for me, two important lessons. Uh, one is strike up conversations with everyone you possibly can when you're at conferences. You never know what uh, um, threads Absolutely. will come from them. And literally, Doug and I happened to sit down. We both uh, were there at the conference without any, we were there on our own, happened to sit down and seats that happened to be next to each other launched into a great conversation and a wonderful friendship that's lasted since then and the assistance to the fellows program. Um, the other thing for me personally that came out of that, um, although I recognized that Pennyfield needed to have a housing component to it, my own background included no nothing in housing. Um, so uh, you and Doug invited me to one of your fresh eyes. Um, that's true. Visits. I forgot about that, yeah. Uh, um, so and I learned so much on that. Talk about wa watching two experts on a topic and the way the two of you analyzed the issues at that college, um, just following along behind you and seeing the, the questions you asked and kind of trying to watch which way your eyes were going so I would see the same thing. Uh, it was a revelatory experience and you made that experience available to uh, fellows, and I know a number of fellows took you up on that as a crash course in housing. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you said that. I had forgotten about it. that was very early on in the in the process. Um, well, that was great. You know, it was just a really wonderful experience. And, uh, you know, we don't often get to do that kind of thing. So it was just a really wonderful uh, way to share the things that we've learned. Uh, Doug is really the, the the brains behind that. I can't take a lot of credit for that. I've, everything I know, I've learned from him. Uh, so he he's just done a great job in uh, doing the consulting as well as you know uh, us contributing to the fellows program. Um, talk a little bit, Sharon. Let's let's uh, transition a little bit. Talk a little bit about your position with Green or your current role with Greenwood and. Talk a little bit about how your interest in leadership uh, has benefited you in that role. Thank you. I, I've been with Greenwood Asher since 2013. Um, so it's it's been a, a long, interesting journey. Uh, Greenwood Asher is one of the oldest um, search firms, search uh, serving higher education, um, founded by Jan Greenwood and Betty Asher, who uh, were two women presidents when there were just enough presidents to sit around two tabletops at a, a conference that they had been, uh, they had been real leaders in, in higher education, um, not to mention being um, pioneer women leaders. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when they invited me to join Greenwood, uh, Greenwood Ash, it was with the idea that I would help with searches. Um, um, given everybody I knew in the, the uh, search process, I had often provided recommendations for fellows and all the other people that I know across higher education. Um, but I had long facilitated strategic planning processes. Um, back when I was a faculty member and you could do consulting one day a week in theory, I often helped with our facilitated strategic planning. Uh, so I started getting requests about would I be available to do that again. And I give great cr uh, credit to Jan and Betty who had hired me to do searches, but said, well, sure, fine, go ahead and um, do the strategic planning project. Um, it wasn't too many years into it that I segue completely into facilitating strategic uh, planning okay. uh, for institutions of all sizes and types and the whole university or the colleges within them, things like that. I still occasionally facilitate a search, but really has a, they tend to have a relationship with an institution where I've had a relationship with strategic planning. So it has given um, me institution-wide understanding of how things work, leadership from the top down and up and through, um, how a strategic plan and the strategic planning process is an act of leadership, and how different leaders use that process to advance the institution for which they are stewards, um, and then uh, use the document itself to move the institution uh, forward to goals. Um, I'm always so impressed with the presidents who in fact do use the strategic plan as a living document that's referred to daily for how they're making decisions, the core values that are involved with it um, toward to get to a goal for the institution. 
Do you ever run across any of your former fellows? All the time, all the time. Um, I always, when I start with a new institution, I always look to see if there are any fellows there. Um, and I reach out to them very quickly so I can reconnect with them, find out how they're doing. I'm always so thrilled good things have happened to them. Also, my own former doctoral students and the students who had been in the various classes I taught, um, they also then end up being interesting and helpful, kind of um, uh, providing insight to me about what's going on in the institution so I can provide, build a context kind of uh, map in my head to be able to help with the strategic planning process. Well, this has been a real wonderful conversation, Sharon. I, I, it's so much fun to talk to you again. It's uh, so much fun to go down uh, memory lane, or shall I say, penny field lane, uh, and, and think about the good times. Thank you for trusting us to help with the fellows program. It was a real honor, uh, really uh, taught us a lot, and uh, it, we really were glad to contribute to it. So all the best to you as you continue your uh, career there with Greenwood. And uh, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for Doug for talking with me on, on a bus ride oh so many years ago. And for you and Doug to be such in, um, in, engaged participants in um, addressing leadership issues for the fellows. Take care, Sharon. Okay.